This is a Q&A lesson on slurs, or in guitar lingo, hammer-ons and pull-offs. And thank you to all my Patreon followers for submitting questions. If you're interested in joining my Patreon or supporting this channel or the site, there's a link for that in the description. Today I'm going to be answering a number of people's questions on slurs, as well as giving some um, contextual advice and technique advice about slurs. But if you're more on the beginner side and you need um, lessons on how to play slurs and beginner exercises for slurs, I do have a number of those on the site and I've put a link for that in the description as well. So before I answer people's questions, I just want to say a few things about slurs first, just to, to ga gain some context to help me answer the questions or to help you to get gain some context before I dive into things. In one way, um, slurs facilitate legato. So a very smooth sound from one note to the next. Uh, and I think that's their, their primary function is to facilitate legato as opposed to So it's a very smooth connected sound. But there are consequences to that sound. When you play a slur, for example a descending slur, um, there's different ways you can play it and that has different musical consequences. So if I simply lift my finger off, I get a very strong weak sound. But if I snap my finger, I can get a quite an even um, attack on each note, so strong, strong. So the way that you play the slur uh, really affects the musical result, and we have to think about that. It's not just a technique, it's, it actually affects our music. So the way you, you play your slur will affect your music in um, hopefully a good way. You know, when we're playing a passage, um, we could play it all plucked notes. Or we could add slurs. And, and, and those slurs can really help with the legato scooping nature of the sound. But there's a couple of other things that come along with that. And, you know, there's performance practice and a whole range of issues. But um, let's, let me go through a couple of things about practicing slurs and the effects that they have, and then I'll dive into the question. So first thing, you gotta practice your slurs every single day. I, I can play slurs if I don't practice them, but I really do notice that my hand will feel quite lethargic, and they don't have like that snappiness to them, like they just don't feel like they can play it cleanly. And when I practice them a lot, I get a much cleaner sound and a much more defined sound. So I really think it's one of those techniques you have to add to your daily practice routine. And if, if you're not practicing them on a daily basis, um, you might run into problems when you play your repertoire. Now let's talk about pull-offs for a second. Uh, pull-offs in particular, there's, there's really two ways you can play them, or three ways actually. You could lift your finger off like I was showing before. So that creates very much a strong, weak sound, a plucked sound followed by a pretty soft sound. That's when I just lift my finger off the string. But if I pull the string down and even rest my finger on the string below, I can get quite an even sound as opposed to a kind of more mellow uh, sound and strong, weak occurrence. But there's also um, a number of levels in between. I could get a little bit of pluck out of the sound, but generally lift my finger away. You know, so this it's more like strong, medium strong sound. Uh, so those three different ways, strong, weak, have a musical effect. Strong, strong has a musical effect. And strong, medium has a, has a musical effect. And how you use it in the music will be dependent on what you want and also historical performance practice and the individual piece that you're playing, uh, where it's happening in the piece. So, uh, and I'm going to be talking about why we sometimes will definitely want the strong weak sound, but I'll, I'll answer that in one of the questions presented. A couple of other things about slurs. Um, the slurs do help with right hand fingering sometimes. You know, instead of having to pluck two notes, 
I can do half the movements in the right hand. So they, it can really reduce right hand fingering sometimes, which is, it can be extremely helpful in some situations where that's really intense. And also for some rapid passages or slurs, you know, uh, or slurs in trills, like in ornaments, um, slurs can be incredibly helpful for a light, fluttery, um, reflexive kind of uh, sound to the music that would be very difficult otherwise. So there's all these, these all, all these important discussions about using slurs. So I, I, I hope that will stimulate you to think about slurs more actively when you're playing them in your music. They're not just a technique we use, they have serious uh, musical results. And in terms of pr historical performance practice, you can, you can really start thinking about that. Um, for example, in the music of Bach, some people think that slurs don't really belong. Maybe they think that slurs add a guitaristic element to Bach's music that might not exist on a keyboard, for example. However, at the same time, um, lute players used, you know, some lute players used slurs. And, and also in early music, the strong, weak, feeling of, of beats is very common. It's like an early music thing that you wouldn't play everything perfectly even, but instead there are strong and weak, you know, beats. And when you listen to other instruments, like, like bowed instruments, when they're switching their bowings or vocalists, you know, where you place the accent is very important. And it's not always just even. And also when we play slurs in Baroque music, um, quite often we'll add them on the strong beat. So in a passage like this, each eighth note there is technically, from a rhythmic standpoint, is, is like a strong, weak, medium, strong, weak, strong, weak, medium, strong, weak, strong. So the, the notes that occur on beats are, are accented notes on a micro level, on a phrasing or uh, rhythmic hierarchy level. So often we'll slur from the strong beat to the weak beat so that we get strong, weak, naturally happening in the music. And it, it's, it's usually quite appropriate in that way. So when we put slurs in our music, especially in Baroque music, for example, you'll often see them from a strong beat to a weak beat. Not all the time, because there are plenty of situations where it might be desirable not to do that and to actually go across a strong beat, but it's a musical consideration you can think about. Big discussion. I could go on about this for, for a very long time, but it's time to dive into some questions. So Jonathan asks, I find it hard to get an even sound in a melody line when using slurs, for example in Vivaldi. Uh, I would like any tips on how the left hand can generate enough speed and power to match the right hand. Um, I think that power is not necessarily the right word, but maybe speed is. Um, there's like a snappiness to the, to the left hand that can help even out your slurs. So like if you do a weak hammer-on, the second note will be quite soft. But if you add a little bit more snappiness, you can get quite a bit of volume out of that note. It's not strength though. It's just like this kind of snappiness to the sound. And in my technique book, there's a number of exercises that talk about that. One thing you can do right off the bat though is don't pluck the first note and just practice getting that tap and getting sounding that second note so that you learn, um, you know, that a snappy finger doesn't need strength, it just needs to be, um, I don't want to use speed or, or the word fast, but, but snappiness is, is more like the word. And in your descending slurs, like I was saying before, instead of lifting your finger off, do like a left hand rest stroke where your finger snaps the string downward, plucks the string, and rests on the string below. That gets a very strong second note. And of course, there's, there's varying levels of in-between where you lift your finger off and pluck the note a little bit. And so you can have a, a huge range of, of a strong second note or a weak second note um, or a medium one, depending on what you want. So just make sure you, you know, you're practicing those, you're doing it every day, and then you can even out in your, your slurs and your melody line. 
But one thing I'll, I'll mention, Jonathan, especially because you brought up Vivaldi, is that maybe you don't want the second note to be even. Um, there's plenty of cases uh, where it could be very, very desirable not to have a strong second note. In that Sands piece I was just playing, desirable not to have a super strong second note. It can, it can really help with the flow of, of the work. Also, um, that, that strong, weak flavor can sound really good. You know, in, re in some Renaissance music, lute players would play with the thumb and then the finger, and the thumb would be considered like that strong note. It's kind of the strong, weak um, feeling to the music that can actually be, I can't do it very well, but like when you hear a loop player do it, it can sound very, very good. And you can do that with just strokes as well. Strong, weak, strong, weak. Or I could do a rest stroke with the eye finger. has a place in early music. Um, you know, to, to accent the stronger values. So on the on the one hand, I want you to practice getting your slurs very even sounding so you have that ability to make it sound all even. But on the other hand, sometimes slurs are specifically used um, to facilitate legato, but also to facilitate the strong, weak nature of the musical line. And there's, you shouldn't be afraid of that, providing you're, it's something you're trying to do and not something that's coming out because of weak left-hand technique. Um, we want to make sure that we're making musical decisions, not just technical decisions. You know, our techniques that we use shouldn't decide how the music sounds, it's how we use the techniques to create the music, musical result we want. Um, so, uh, but Jonathan, you can check out some of the exercises in my, in my technique book and look at the individual lessons I have for that, um, which will give you more. But I, I hope some of those little tips um, help, in particular about the descending um, slurs and, um, and some of those exercises for just doing like tap exercises with the left hand to um, get used to that snappy nature that is possible in the fingers. Okay, another question. Gordon asks, um, a question related to clean pull-off slurs on strings E down to B without striking the adjacent string with pull-offs. So what he means is that um, sometimes when you do a pull-off in, in this hand, you know, you might accidentally hit the string below because you're, you're trying to pluck that string. You know, when you accidentally hit the string below and it pings out and makes a sound. Um, so, and he, and he brings up an example in, in the Brower Etude where, it, in Brower Etude number um, 11, where it's even harder because these two fingers are down. Uh, let's see, where is it? I think he was saying the fourth finger is accidentally hitting that open B string, which makes sense because the higher up on the neck you go, the more you'll be pushing these strings down and the action will be getting high. So let me just um, uh, address a couple of things there. So first thing, um, Gordon, make sure you're practicing your descending slurs in the way that I was t telling Jonathan to, or I've been talking about the whole video, is that there's, there's places where you just lift a finger off. So you just literally bringing the finger straight out from the, the, the string and you would never strike the string below in that case. So make sure you're practicing that. But if that's not the sound you want, you might want more pluck. So you could do a rest stroke into that string below. In this case, you just have to be careful to get it out of the way before you have to strike the open B. 
See my fourth finger's touching the B string, but then just re releasing. Or just lifting off. And then in terms of the in-between, so like do, getting a little bit of pluck, but not too much, make sure that your guitar is angled upright enough. If you're down like this, you're more likely to hit the string below. But if you're angling the guitar like this, um, there's, more, there's more room underneath to bypass that string. Unless you have a super steep hand angle, but that's not possible for everyone. So good guitar position that's relatively upright. And then you, you just have to practice with those with those two different types of pull-offs or an in-between one and find um, one of those to, to work for you. I think in Brower's music, it's, it's very perfectly acceptable to let that second note be a little bit softer. So I think you could just, just pull that finger off. Especially at, um, at faster tempos that a pull-off like literal, like just outward pull from lift of the finger is more appropriate because you'll get more sound if the proximity of the slur is close to the plucking finger. When you're going slowly, I didn't get any volume out of there, did I, with the lift? So it just didn't work that time. Not really working, I would have to do an actual pluck. So that time I did like a full rest stroke into the string below. And then of course there's the in-between. But it's tough, in this particular situation it's tough. So if I was going at a slower tempo, I would use the, the, the true pluck or rest stroke in the left hand. If it's at a faster tempo, I wouldn't worry about it and I would just lift the finger off and I think that's plenty. So th that's a great example, and thanks for, for asking that particular one. And I, I hope that if you practice those different types of pull-offs, that, that, that'll solve that problem for you. Colin asks a question. Um, I have weaknesses showing in my technique while learning Contabile in D by Merits. Glissandos, I think. Um, so glissandos and slurs are different techniques. But um, thanks for bringing it up, though, because in Merits' Contabile, uh, in D, number seven from his, his school for guitar, um, he uses a slur marking for his glissandos. And that, that's very common in the 19th century um, to just use a phrase mark to indicate a, a number of things. So a slur marking on the music, that little arch line between two notes, can mean a number of different things. You know, phrase marks are just an arched line. Um, and in this case... Merit says glissandos are just an arch line. Unless he's actually trying to slur from the F sharp up to the, the B, but which would be possible on a 19th century guitar, but I don't think that was the intention. I think it's a, it, it's a glissando. Um, but you'll see that little line, and it can mean anything. I've come across 19th century scores where the slur mark could mean a slur, or it could mean a glissando, or it could just mean legato. Uh, it could mean any of those things. It doesn't have to necessarily mean a slur. In the Brower example that, we, that I was looking at before, I'm pretty certain that, that, that slur markings mean slurs, and we can be pretty confident in those cases. In other people's editions, sometimes they use a dotted line for an editorial slur, there's all these these different situations, but but the, I think the important thing is that that slurs really do, and the indication of a slur on a score means legato. It means like it doesn't always mean strong weak, but it means like those two notes are connected. When you see them in bow markings, and and a violinist has to bow across a number of notes with just in one direction in their bow, da da da. Um, it, it's a smooth sound, and that bow marking can look like slur markings, and they are. Um, it, it's like a legato marking. It means don't um, attack this, the second note, make it smooth. So uh, that's a really important fact. In this piece, whatever it is, let's see. Glissandos 
our very legato way of getting from point A to point B. So we've discussed a lot of things in this lesson, but I, the, the main point here is that you should practice your slurs every day in the different ways I've described and at different tempos. So, you know, going slow. So you can hear each one and practice the movements of the hand that's required there, but also fast. You know, so that you understand what's going on with your technique and the, and the sound that you're getting from it. When you're, you know, practicing doing a strong second note or a weak second note or uh, descending slurs, a lift or a pluck from the sound. So every day you're practicing your slurs and you're practicing these different ways of playing the slurs so that when it comes to repertoire, you're able to get whatever sound you require for that particular piece of music. And also just realizing that, that slurs are, yes, they're guitar technique, but we don't care about guitar techniques, right? We, I mean, we do, but they, they have nothing to do with music. Like music is played and performed in a certain way and you use your instrument and your technique to deliver the musical sound that you want. So we care about our technique, of course, but when it comes to the musical decision, we don't let the technique itself decide how the music sounds. We, we practice our technique so that we get the musical sound we want from a piece and if we think that a slur will help with that sound, and if we play our slur in a certain way, and it will help with that sound, then we use it. If we think it doesn't help, then we don't use it. And, and that's just what it, what it comes down to, is that we're making musical decisions, but keeping our, our technique in tip, top shape, right? So that um, whatever comes up in our repertoire, we're ready to tackle, but we're going to make it sound musical.